a, a joint um, presentation here. So I'm just going to share. Hopefully we'll uh, see it. Let me know if you see anything that's uh, that's not working or it doesn't look quite right. So yeah, I guess first thing is um, you can see that all right. If you if you don't, just let me know. Hello. Uh, yeah. So uh, actually, we've sort of got a um, a breadth of of different perspectives here in some ways. So. Um, as Dan mentioned, I'm the University of Oxford. Is actually is a visiting uh, research fellow there, um, and um, I also work for the Energy Systems Catapult, and I'll talk about them in a in a, in a bit more as well. And and Dan is with Capgemini. Um, so we're sort of getting a mix of academia, sort of not for profit, uh, part government funded um, catapult, and then industrial view with Capgemini. So uh, this talk's really going to be um, talking about our experience. We work together. Uh, many years in academia. Uh, so some of that work is going to be presented. And then we'll have some perspective from uh, our various um, experiences in, in Catapult and, and Capgen and I about a topic which is, is quite close to our, uh, our uh, hearts. Um, I'll move on very quickly. So I will be kind of talking about some motivation, why we care about this system, uh, and some features and observations which make it quite interesting um, in, a, in a forecasting context. Uh, and then Danitz will take over from there and we'll talk about uh, research challenges um, and really mainly talking about a review paper which we recently published, uh, which, which looked at a, across the landscape at all the different uh, forecasting papers. We reviewed something like 220 papers uh, to sort of understand what you know, the trends and gaps are and, and we'll, we'll talk about those as well. And then we'll finish with some recommendations. And um, we've got kind of two separate strands of this. We've got a sort of academic recommendations and then we've got some for the wider sector, which I'll talk about, which come from the catapult. OK, uh, without further ado, I should probably tell you a bit about what the catapult is, really. So um, we have the um, we have a, it's a funding um, council, Innovate UK, which um, a non-departmental government body, which um, has been funding innovation and research in the UK. Um, and of several years ago, they developed these catapults, which focus on areas which are very important for innovation and, and for the economy in the UK. Um, and they, they're meant to do various things. So they focus on particular areas. We are the energy systems catapult. So we look at the energy system. Um, but we've got others such as the offshore renewable uh, energy catapult, which look at offshore renewables, which are obviously very connected to what we do. And we've got places like digital and connected places catapult, which looks at things like transport and smart cities and that sort of thing. And really what we're trying to do there is support innovation across the sector. But another really important part of what we do is to try and bridge the gap between the different stakeholders. So really we, we try and connect academia to industry, to government, um, and really sort of help see if we can also change policies in some case or regulations uh, where, where it would help support either innovation or the UK economy in general. So if you're interested in any more of that, please get in touch and I'm, I'm happy to um, to discuss or point you to um, the right people. So, um, OK, so the context of what we're talking about today. So um, I think first it's, it should be clear where we're talking about. So obviously different countries have different um, electricity networks and grids. Um, the what we're talking about here was really the area we tried to define for the review paper. It's it isn't, has, doesn't have hard boundaries. There's obviously sort of a fuzzy area here, but what we're really trying to do was to, to you know, form an area which would be kind of a, a um, has similar characteristics, very much looking at maybe where most smart grids sort of sit, local area microgrids, really where essentially you could almost define it in terms of where there's sort of these technology which, is, which, which you know, uh, can cause major disruptions. So EVs and local, you know, and, and other low carbon technologies. So, um, you know, of course, it will vary across the, the, the um, across, you know, uh, different countries. Uh, but what we were trying to vaguely say here, you know, in some ways was, you know, you know, what's, where are we going to get start to get some more smart technologies, where to starting to get more smart uh, control, you know, this area, which has a lot of volatility, you know, what what research has been done in this area in, in the in the in the area of forecasting? You might ask why why we care about forecasting. I mean, on its own, it's typically being used, you know, very much at the sort of transmission levels and and, and for balancing supply and and, and demand. Um, but there's more and more applications, as I say, coming in at sort of lower voltage, 
uh, where we're looking at sort of trying to estimate demand side response. We're looking at storage systems. We also have longer term scenario planning. So that's maybe more scenario driven forecasts. Um, and also, you know, electricity markets in general, you know, electricity price forecasting may become more important as we move to sort of local uh, energy markets. Uh, Dennis might mention a few more about the applications that came across, but I just wanted to sort of set the scene that there's, there's quite a lot of important areas where forecasting is a core element and perhaps the, the research isn't really, um, isn't really quite uh, mature enough in those areas. So I'm going to talk about some of the features of this system. Um, as part of the context here, um, I, I want to kind of use the storage control example as, as the sort of um, as the as the context because it's an area we're very familiar with. We did a lot of work in this area, um, but also I think you know it's it's a common one that's that's used across the the, um, the research landscape. So really, what we're talking about is a forecast could be given for say a day ahead, um, and then you want to you want to plan the storage of this device. So you charge at the time when the demand is low and you discharge when it's high. So you can either keep the battery, keep the, the network within its capacity constraints, or, or perhaps you might be also trying to control it with regard to say price controls or something like that. Uh, we did actually uh, implement real, uh, some real control as part of a, a innovation project. This was several years ago, me and, me and Dan Etzel both worked on this. Um, we had, a few brief trials where we had some storage devices connected to several low voltage networks, and we implemented some control on those using, using uh, the data we collected from the low voltage networks. Um, and so what you can, one thing to highlight here is, you know, often what you see within the literature is, um, you know, no forecasts are used often. And instead you'll, you'll get, so, you, so what you'll get is this sort of yellow line, which will be the new peak. Um, and you can see there's a big drop, but won't really be included is the uncertainty that's associated to the forecast. So your peak reduction will be sort of given a 70%, but perhaps the best you can do is really uh, sort of 11% based on the uncertainty in your, in your forecast models. So um, the first thing I want to address is sort of how low voltage networks are modeled. There's, as Dennis will talk about the data situation, you know, low voltage network data is not um, ubiquitous and in fact what's often done is aggregations of, of smart meters because that data is a little bit more re readily available and of course you get sort of the this sort of very rough um, demand profiles so this is a weak profile for one household and as you aggregate up five households 25 to 50 to 500 you can see things get a lot smoother and of course at the top here you can start seeing profiles which look quite quite common um, sort of at least for modeling sort of state level or, or um, you know, system level demand. What you'll then get also is a relationship between the size of this feeder and the relative forecast accuracy, or you could also say the relative um, optimality. So if you're looking at storage device, you could say, well, what's the peak reduction? And often you see this sort of power law fit and you get a very nice, um, a very nice fit. You might have some deviation, of course, but as you get larger and larger feeder, it should be easier to optimize what you're doing, at least in a relative way, and your accuracy should uh, sort of start tailing off there, really. Whereas if you're looking at, say, a few households, um, you know, things, things are very difficult to forecast, or at least in a relative sense. Um, but the thing is, we're not really seeing that um, necessarily. Um, this is actual, actual low voltage network demand. And as you can see, it's a little bit, this is a bit zoomed out. So we're looking at sort of a, a year and a half here. Um, these are, what you can see here is four different feeders, low voltage, and the number of consumers on there. So the number of MPANs. So we've got 44, 30, 42, and one here. And then with the number of these, which are residential or domestic consumers. So in this case, they're all entirely residential. Here you've got one commercial and one residential, and here it's just purely commercial. And you can see already there's a lot of diversity across this, which you wouldn't necessarily get if you were just aggregating uh, smart meters. And even when you have two feeders here, which are relatively similar, this is 44, this is 42, you can see there's large changes in behavior. So clearly this collection of households, uh, a lot of them are going away um, at the Christmas holiday or, or near Easter. Um, whereas this doesn't really seem to be the case in the top feeder. 
And down here, of course, you get sort of individual. Uh, this actually is office lighting. Uh, and you can see it has very different behavior from the, the other ones, which are, are primarily residential. Okay, so what do we see then when we actually try to um, to look at sort of the size of your feeder versus the the um, the sort of error or the you know the optimality of of a, an application on here? Well, if you first focus on the left hand plot here, um, we have a forecast. Uh, each one of these is a forecast of a different feeder. There's a hundred feeders involved here, um, and uh, you can see, uh, you know, what I did actually in the previous plot was I actually sort of deleted these ones up here which is what we found in reality. And there's a couple more over here. Um, and we see that this sort of aggregation of households isn't quite as straightforward as, as we sort of expect. Um, and this really changes the applications in terms of you know, what we can maybe able to do and, and you know, what we could expect to do. You know, with the previous plot, you could say, well, we have a very good idea of how optimal we can be with a, an application, whereas maybe um, now we, we're not quite as, as, uh, as clear. Um, in particular, we did dive into these though, and we did see there was unique features in most of them. So um, I'm not sure if you're aware of, if you have overnight storage heaters in America, but there's these big brick heaters we have, and they're on a separate tariff. And um, essentially you heat them overnight, and that's where there's a cheaper tariff overnight. Um, and then they release heat throughout the day. Um, and what we found is that there was a large number of these feeders had a large number of these overnight storage heaters on the, with the households. OK, and they didn't fit the pattern. And in fact, none of the others who were, were within this sort of power law um, relationship actually had um, didn't have the uh, overnight steerage heaters. OK, so um, we also found another one here was landlord lighting, which I showed earlier. Uh, and there's a couple more anomalous ones. We couldn't quite pin down the reasons behind. Um, we had some some ideas, but we didn't want to sort of um, presume anything uh, too much. And just to show you back to the example of the storage, this is peak reduction. This is ordered in terms of the size of the demand. Um, although there is kind of a relationship as you get larger feeders, you can have a, an improved peak reduction. Um, very much uh, a sort of the, you know, if you're looking at individual feeders, there's a big wide difference between there. So two things to learn from that is, you know, obviously there is a relationship, but it's not a particularly strong one. And you know, perhaps understanding that is 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 not as easy as you'd expect by just looking at forecast errors, um, and that's a that's a big lesson for forecasting in general. You know, the error measure should replicate what you're trying to do, and it doesn't necessarily always do that either, even when you choose the accuracy measure carefully. Um, another thing I want to sort of point out here is that there's a lot of assumptions about weather and energy demand. Um, and therefore, if you're constructing a forecast model, you want to make sure you're using the right inputs. Presenting here, I've got um, the demand from uh, sort of, uh, I believe it's state level. It's from the global energy forecasting data, US data. Um, and you can see the relationship with temperature and load is pretty good. There's obviously deviations, which are caused by other things, but you can see a clear relationship where the colder it gets, the, the more heating you have and the warmer it gets, the more air conditioning. Um, now here on the right is a UK demand for a low voltage feeder. Of course, because it's very cold in the UK, you don't really have air conditioning typically, it never gets warm enough. Um, but this is one of probably the, the, the strongest relationships we found. And even that doesn't have a particularly um, strong, um, a strong relationship or strong features, perhaps to su suggest that you know, temperature isn't as strong uh, as you'd expect. Actually to go further from this, when we developed models for those 100 feeders with and without temperature, we actually found including temperature in them actually was detrimental to many of the forecasts uh, that we used and in other cases didn't really affect it. So there's still a question about what features are important at the other level. And I suppose my point here is to say that there's still a lot of work and research to be done. Um, just to sort of give a um, maybe a little overview of where LB forecasting is. And, and I guess I, re I you know, uh, and Dennis will talk a bit more about, um, you know, our findings from, from our proper literature review. This is very much a surface level look. Um, the author, the, actually the, the organizers of the global energy forecasting competition put this, this graph together. It's based on some subjective views, but essentially looking at the maturity of, of um, different forecasting systems from a point forecasting basis to probabilistic. Um, so we have the solar power forecasting here, electricity price forecasting, 
long-term load forecasting, wind power forecasting. And, and here is what we are kind of looking at here, which is the short-term load forecasting, which is sort of saying, you know, there's a lot of work being done in the point forecasting, but not so much in the probabilistic, whereas wind has a lot of probabilistic forecast uh, that's been done. Now, for our point is actually we want to break this down because this, this actually comes down to various uh, low voltage levels, uh, smart meter level. These are not these are sort of all bunched in here. And if when you do sort of a very basic look at the, the sort of count of literature out there that sort of and this is a very basic Google, Google search search, uh, it's Google Scholar uh, search. As I say, um, you know, the review, review paper was much more rigorous than this, but it, it confirmed this. You know, there's very little research looking at low voltage and there's very little, you know, although slightly more perhaps in smart meter load forecasting. And arguably a lot of this work should be probabilistic because of the, the high volatility. Now, just to finish uh, my part, I just want to focus on one odd feature or at least one um, feature that's very unique to the low voltage and especially to the household level. As we, as you saw, there's a lot of volatility at these levels, but as you move down the aggregations, you could look at household. Now, at the household level, there's a few more applications we can look at. You can also look at control at individual households as well as you know maybe other energy efficiency uh, initiatives. But it gets a lot more spiky. Um, now, arguably, you know, probabilistic is is very much required at this level if we're to sort of make any understanding at this level. Um, but I do want to highlight one feature that we found, which was was uh, made made this very complicated. Uh, was this double penalty effect. So about, um, well, it must be eight, eight or eight, seven or eight years ago now, uh, my, myself and Danit, so we, with, with others, researched um, this double penalty error. We, we, we ran a forecasting competition to look at the effect of, um, you know, we, to try and forecast households based on their smart meter data. And no matter what we did, pretty much all the time, we were beaten by this flat right. forecast. So the, the... Um, so oh, I think that was a microphone. Um, what we found though was, um, you know, the flat forecast beat everything we tried. We tried something sophisticated, you know, and of course this is point forecast. So there's, there's clearly going to be a bit of limitation in the information you can provide. And the reason for this is this double penalty effect. So if you imagine this green is the actual and the red is a forecast, um, you know, in any traditional point wise, forecast metric like a um, RMSE or a mean absolute error, you're going to get penalized twice here. You get penalized for producing a peak that never existed, and you're penalized for missing the original peak, whereas this flat thing, uh, you know, is fine and it only gets penalized once relatively. So, so, you know, objectively, according to this measure, the flat forecast score is much better. But of course, it's completely useless and it can't be used in any applications, for instance, um, you know, storage applications. At least with this one here, you could potentially at least anticipate a peak is coming, um, and that might be useful for, say, you know, uh, at least preparing your battery ahead of time with sufficient charge. And then if you have some sort of rolling update, you could still utilize it to, um, you could still utilize it to to reduce your peaks. Um, so what we did is, I mean, it's a very um, sort of, you know, it's 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 not got all the nice properties that a metric does. It's it doesn't have the triangle equality, etc., and things like this. But we did a little shuffle. So we we allowed our time series to shuffle a few half hours either side, and then we measured the error with the traditional error measure. Um, and then we could so at least start matching our subjective impression of the of the forecast with with an objective measure. Um, and so what I've done here, we just demonstrated this shuffle with four forecasts. A flat one, the, the best forecast, one that's slightly off with the, the timing of the peak, and one which has got a way uh, very far away from it. Okay, and if you, you consider the, the original error, it would suggest that the, the flat forecast uh, F1 is actually better than F3, which you know arguably has, has some information in it. And then of course, if you allow some shuffles, you suddenly at least can then say, well, F3 at least now is beating this flat no information model. And of course, you can go too far. So you, you might end up in this situation if you shuffle it too much that you end up with sort of matching, um, you know, the flat and, the, and that. Um, so I just want to like, I think I've, this is my last slide before moving, uh, we move to uh, Donuts's part. But, you know, one thing we wanted to say is how bad is this, this sort of double penalty effect? So we forecasted hundreds, I think it was something like 600 different households with uh, a few methods. 
And um, we compared it to a flat forecast. Then we compared it to a flat forecast with also this adjusted error measure we created, and we plotted them. So this essentially divided and categorized the, the space into sort of three quadrants. Um, down here, your forecast is worse than the flat forecast in both measures. So, you know, that's going to happen anyway. Some households are just unpredictable. Up here, it doesn't matter which metric you use. Again, you're at least beating the flat forecast. But over here, um, you found that, you know, a good number, I believe it might have been in the 40% range, uh, the new measure actually sort of improved, improved the sort of comparison. Now, that might not be completely uh, honest in terms of saying, yes, you know, that's all of them are, are good forecasts now because of the shuffle. They might they might just be poorer and you've sort of, you know, you've, you've allowed force to match. But I think it highlights the issue here that, you know, if we're trying to produce forecasts and the research is out there using these metrics, we're going to be getting false results. Um, so um, I'll stop sharing now, and I believe um, Danitz will take over for the second half, um, and I'll, I'll return for a couple of slides at the end. Uh, can you see this okay? Yep. Excellent. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, yeah, so uh, now I'm afraid we are going to a bit more tedious part. Um, so um, first of all, just to check why is low voltage forecasting important at all? And we already saw, uh, you know, like people were doing kind of low voltage forecasting before because of planning and maintenance and anomaly detection. But now with all these low carbon technologies coming, uh, we have this new, relatively new, new things like um, storage problems, balancing becomes difficult, these local dispatches problems, uh, optimization problems become massive, and also flexibility becomes very important. When I say flexibility, meaning uh, moving load either in time or in space, trying to hit uh, maybe greener sources of energy. So for example, moving some things to run um, in the night when winds, wind is blowing, or uh, I don't know, in UK case, kind of moving from moving energy from, from Scotland uh, south when, when there is a high wind and then uh, uh, trying to do some stuff in, a, in, a, in the middle of a day when there is sun uh, shining and so on. Also, we are seeing uh, just uh, kind of uh, beginnings of this peer-to-peer uh, -peer trading and, and so on. So, so there are uh, these new um, applications that are coming and this is why low voltage forecasting becoming more and more important. Okay. I think you're cut off a bit of the slides at the bottom. I'm not sure if it's in full screen, but there, yeah, I can see it now, sorry. Okay, sorry, yeah, thanks. Um, okay. So, um, what are the uh, what are the problems here? So, what are the main, main challenges? Right, um, it is difficult to model and optimize uh, due to lack of data. Um, low voltages do not scale up easily because they are all different, right? Uh, we saw before they are quite heterogeneous. So if you have a rural low voltage, you will have complete low voltage network. You will have completely different data than in a, a urban in the middle of London. Also depends on some local kind of I don't know lifestyles, uh, temperature, and so on. Uh, what type of industry you have in 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 that area? Uh, what type of uh, small and medium enterprises, and so on? Um, what are the movements? So when people kind of go to work and when they're coming back in different areas will be different, and also this volatility. So so um, basically, if you have a lot of things that are not very smooth, that's much much more difficult to predict. So basically, we use aggregation in order to be able to predict anything, right? And this is exactly why, why this problem is so difficult. Uh, for that reason, it is also quite um, unclear what to include and what to ignore. So for example, would temp will temperature, wind chill and so on help me if I don't have a lot of uh, overnight storage or, or elect electricity heating or anything like this? Uh, will uh, traffic data help me? Um, and, and and so on. So, so so there are a lot of potential data sources that you can add to to help us to, to predict this kind of spiky spiky um, uh, time series. 
but it's not clear what what it, what to include and what to ignore in different situations because these things differ so so, so much each from each other. Uh, also, uh, there is currently a lot of effort on higher voltages in our homes. So, for example, uh, that there is some magnificent work about big, te big tech uh, data center solutions where they try to kind of schedule things so, so, so they hit kind of greener sources of energy and so on. But again, their profiles are kind of much flatter, so it's much easier to predict. And when you have a good prediction, then you can kind of shuffle things around and optimize them uh, much easier than here. Um, if, so so um, there is also a lot of work for homes because we, at the end of the day, we kind of use similar appliances. But uh, unfortunately, this left out small and medium enterprises because, for example, I, I did some work on um, uh, analyzing smart meter data from, from small enterprises. And unfortunately, you know, like hairdresser is completely different from plastic factory, it's completely different from a kind of bagel kind of cafe and so on. So, so, so this is the problem. It's, it's very, very difficult to kind of scale up or industrialize any, any of those. So, so these people are kind of left out in a way with current solutions. And this is why we need to do more about low, low voltage and, and this kind of spiky, spiky time series. Um, also, what we found while, while uh, uh, researching for this uh, review paper is that applications actually often ignore completely forecast features, and sometimes this is this is not good. And so I'll um, talk about it uh, a bit more. So what we um, what we gathered from from the paper uh, is, uh, you know, like this standard kind of applications like in design and planning, in operation, control and management, anomaly detection, flexibility, trading, and then some, some all kinds of different applications, for example, to pre-process your data, to clean up, to find anomalies in it, um, to kind of protect privacy, you use forecast instead of the real data and so on. Um, what is interesting is that different applications will require different forecast features. So, for example, for this design and planning, um, you, you might just want kind of mean and standard deviation. You, you, you are not really interested in, in, in a whole kind of time series and, and so on. But what we found is that, yeah, sometimes uh, these applications just assume something about the forecast, completely ignoring some important actually features. So for example, maybe you cannot actually assume that these are kind of, that this is Gaussian, it's not Gaussian, so, so that, that's bad. And this will kind of completely influence your application, but yeah, people, people just don't think about uh, forecast features. Also, this brings us to the question, what is a good forecast for your application? So, so is it, for example, it depends really. Um, it depends, do you need kind of real time? Do you need near real time? Do you need offline? So, so you, can, you can throw much more computational uh, resources, right? Also, how important is accuracy? Is it just points, uh, kind of a set point? Is it confidence interval that you are after? Um, is it is it kind of peak accuracy is much much more important than average accuracy or or not? It it really depends on on, on your application. Okay, so what we found is yeah that people are trying kind of lot of different uh, methods on 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 this problem on uh, on a spiky um, uh, time series. So we tried to box them in, in, in statistical. Uh, so we have all kind of regressions done on it, uh, autoregressive models, ARMA, SARIMA, and so on, exponential smoothing arc, and so on. Then we have a lot and lot of ML and AI models, and this, this literature is kind of growing. All kind of uh, neural networks, all kind of deep learning kind of thrown into this. Um, we also have some... Uh, uh, starting small but growing probabilistic uh, uh, methods, uh, prediction interval, density estimation, kernel density estimation, uh, then quantile reg regressions, which um, came up quite uh, uh, well, actually, in uh, some recent competitions. And a lot of other kind of mathematical um, uh, different models like wavelets, square theory, graph base, Monte Carlo, and so on. 
Uh, we also then have like all combinations, kind of hybrid uh, methods out of all this uh, mentioned before. And we also have ensembles, which are basically families with different parameters of the similar models. Okay, so th there are also, uh, yeah, we are completely aware there are, there are other models that are not maybe mentioned on this slide, but again, like their possibility. However, um, we still need to work on. So, so there is no state of the art method, unfortunately. So we cannot tell you use this for, for this spiky time series because um, different applications will require different approaches. So there is no simple kind of answer to this. Um, there are some, uh, I tried to, to box here um, different kind of areas that, that represent methodolo methodological challenges in this. And they are around big one around data, which is, I guess, generic challenge for any kind of machine learning or statistical kind of modeling, um, which is a limited number of data sets available. And this comes from um, with two problems. One is privacy and security. Um, so, so for example, um, distribution networks don't want to cannot open this because of uh, of their policies. And, but also that few of the sets that are open then are used by everybody. So it's quite biased. Actually, this kind of uh, gives birth to quite biased models, right? Because the same data is, is used over and over again. Um, the other uh, big methodological, methodological uh, uh, challenge is the smoothness that we already kind of mentioned. And um, uh, this is... Uh, um, uh, uh, this double penalty peak and different error measures. Uh, we will mention some recommendations later on. And uh, yeah, the, the third big kind of bucket of, of problems is about features. So what kind of features do you actually need? Uh, are you interested in a complete distribution or it's enough just to take some parameters? Uh, what is horizon? Um, this is quite important, obviously. Is it, is it long term? Is it short term? How short? Very short and, and so on. Um, what type of skill do you need? Maybe you don't need kind of super, super, um, uh, super good accuracy. Uh, so uh, then, then you can kind of tra trend it off uh, on uh, computational complexity or time. Uh, do, do you need it real time again? Like, and uh, uh, what is aggregation level? So if we can aggregate, great, because then, then we will come up with better uh, predictions. But again, like what, what is the... the um, Good amount of aggregation that we can do. On the other hand, for, for privacy issues, for example, in the UK, we are not allowed to, to get uh, smart meters data, but we can get aggregated over feeder. So there is again like some, some trade offs between aggregation and uh, accuracy there to be um, thought of. Okay. Um, so uh, here are some trends that we noticed in all of this kind of. 220 papers. And these are some, some kind of emerging trends. Um, the, the, the one important one is about automation, where people try to uh, create pipelines that uh, uh, automatically kind of pre process data, then do feature and parametric, uh, parameter selection agnostic to what will be applied as a forecast metal, uh, method uh, afterwards. Um, do some clustering maybe, uh, then apply, ev evaluate different forecasting methods based on errors, and then apply the best ones in order to finish with the best result at the end. And uh, what is interesting also is that real-time methods now start to emerge, and uh, with online forecasting, with rolling window, with uh, data streams and sensor data put in. Um, Another uh, part of, of trends that we saw was um, people trying to basically divide and conquer. So, so try to split this load in some way, either filter based uh, on some, some kind of signal processing or, um, or uh, you know, by value, by frequency, uh, this and that, and then try to combine or adjust methods so they, they can work as best as they can. Um, both classification and regression are used to split load and, and all kinds of uh, signal processing uh, techniques. And finally, for all this to work, so, so both for automation, for, for uh, splitting load and so on, you need to have reliable uh, error metrics. 
And for that, this double penalty is kind of a big issue. So we saw uh, emergence of, of different um, uh, error measures that are trying to actually uh, mitigate this double penalty, like uh, local permutation in variant distance, pressure measures, adjusted average measure that Steve uh, mentioned before, and so on. Um, so looking at this 221 paper, what we found is a lot of noise basically. So we found a lot of paper, unfortunately, lacking reproducibility. So no data sets or code available whatsoever. So in a way, we have to trust you what, what you told us because we cannot reproduce any, any of that. that. Um, connected to this also accessibility in a way that, um, in, a, in, a, in a sense that it's not like behind the paywall, but more like a language used in papers uh, is um, has a lack of precision. So, for example, we don't know what is the sampling rate of the, of uh, things used. We don't know uh, what is horizon, and uh, so so not enough details so we can reproduce results. Right. So that's a big problem. Uh, also lack of benchmarks. Uh, so this obviously affects evaluation because it's difficult to compare like to like, right? But it also affects innovation because you, you cannot move on if you, if you don't have proper be benchmarks, like, right? Because we cannot kind of see what, what works and what doesn't. Um, so for example, out of this 221 paper, just like quarter used uh, open source data, and that, which is great, but unfortunately of this kind of um, quarter, half of them use kind of four open data sets, which means that we are really, really biased to kind of Western style, kind of Irish, UK, um, Australian and uh, US data. So this is the, the uh, everything we, we see here, right? So this is a bit of a problem. So, so we need to go much more diverse. Uh, there are some uh, some kind of attempts to, to, to overcome this. So, there, so, so I put here, there is this uh, Monash time series forecasting repository, which is full of time series, open, open data time series. Some of them are on energy and they're really good. Um, uh, Monash University in Australia. And we tried to compile um, a list on GitHub of uh, open um, data sets especially for low voltage load forecasting so you can find them on or you can find that on a, a github on, on this address and we hope to kind of um, maintain that uh, um, that uh, list in order to, to help people to find uh, open data sets to run their algorithms on and you so, so you can reproduce results and you can kind of uh, create benchmarks okay So um, these were kind of academic uh, research gaps, but also working and consulting um, for, for um, distribution networks in UK mostly, but also in Europe. Um, what I found is that um, there are gaps in industry too. So basically data collection on L LV level is very, very challenging. Um, there is a problem also with the data management maturity lags. So basically, uh, when I say fair, I mean kind of findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable data, um, the, the kind of things that already happened in pharma and other industries. So, so this industry is still lagging uh, uh, for, for this. So even when data is collected, it's quite difficult to trust it because, you know, like it doesn't have an owner, it's not uh, maintained, it doesn't have data dictionaries and so on. There are massive privacy and security challenges because obviously it's kind of national infrastructure in, in the UK, for example. So um, uh, policies uh, uh, make it impossible to, to open this data or to share it. Um, Smart meter number is uh, PII information. So um, this, this means that whenever they want to give you feeder data, uh, 
location is out, which then makes it difficult to match it with weather and, and so on. So there are all these problems in it. And there are also problems with models. Um, knowledge transfer from academia is challenging for those reasons of reproducibility and accessibility and, and lack of benchmarking. But also evaluation of models is hard because different applications will have different needs, uh, which means that it's difficult to kind of scale up quickly, right? Because you might want to uh, develop your forecast, but then you'll use it for three different applications. So you will have to develop at the end three different forecasts because features are different and so on. And also important features, even for the same application, might then differ for different LVs. So for example, what worked amazingly well for your urban LVs will not work anymore for your rural and then vice versa. So data model and governance is very, very challenging then. And also there is, I think there is a problem in industry uh, of uh, power engineering, uh, power engineers not really trusting in ML solutions. So it's quite difficult to, to kind of innovate in that, in that way because the trust is not there. Uh, also, um, usually significant customization of models is needed. So that, that, that makes it very expensive to develop these models. So um, it's quite difficult to start, okay. So based on all this, we have kind of put some recommendations in our review paper um, in order to try to help researchers to, to come up with uh, better papers. Um, so first of all, um, some clarity in problem definition should be there. So, so if you are writing forecasting paper, uh, please do um, add kind of forecast horizon, level of aggregation, sampling rate, and so on, thinking how somebody will be able to reproduce what you what you came up with, right? Also, for, in order to, to see that everything is going as, as, um, as it should be, uh, it would be nice to see time series plots so you can check that your assumptions are actually correct and so on. What error measures did you use? Um, so, so what was your data source, what were pre-processing steps and so on, and what were your, your forecasting scheme? Was it kind of direct, was it iterative, was it in a kind of improving and, and so on, continuously improving and so on. And um, the, yeah, the, the, the big point is the Irish SER data is not the only possible source. I know that Beacon Street was is not open anymore, so it's just commercially viable, I think, but there are there are more. So please do look at, at our web page or Monash uh, time forecasting series. Uh, there are also some open uh, data sets in UK that we try to pull through this. So, so there, there are more sources, definitely. And we tried also to include other uh, uh, kind of uh, worldwide sources of yeah, and if you know for more, please do come and tell us uh, or just include through GitHub um, in this big list of, of data. Um, then there is a need for benchmarks and robust validation. So if you want to write the paper, write paper about comparing things. Um, again, like when you do this, um, if you can explain uh, exactly how you split things in train and test, don't mix train and test features and so on. Um, data sets that you should use, uh, think about them. Are they sufficiently large and representative and how this influences your, your uh, results? Um, Hyper parameters should be also like transparent. So what did you use? Um, uh, are they based on test set or they're really kind of started in, with, with train set and so on? Uh, improving access to literature is actually just the point that uh, a lot of papers are behind the paywalls. So if you can, uh, if you can um, publish your manus submitted mag manuscript, that's great because then people can kind of see what you did. We try to do the same so you can see also archive uh, version of, of this paper. Um, there is a big, big, uh, I think, problem about privacy. And um, if you work on, uh, on uh, differential privacy, federated learning, homomorphic encryption, I think this is great our area to, to, to go into. So the developing and evaluating methods for, for this in low voltage data sets would actually enable us to, to open and share more, or at least model 
if we can share and and be able to 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 validate those models. So I think privacy in in uh, energy data sets is great area to 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 go into because I think it will be it it, it will just grow in the next couple of years. Um, there are a couple of things. Um, so there uh, a lot of a lot of um, advancement was progress was seen in the uh, last decade on numerical weather um, forecasting, but this is not yet kind of reached the, the low voltage uh, load forecast accuracy. So we hope to see this translated actually. And if you can include weather grades, and if you can tell us, did it make difference or, or not, that, that would be great. And also to move towards probabilistic forecasting, because then we can see also how, how um, uh, you know, like how uncertain we are about those forecasts, right? Um, so, and also like if you are doing probabilistic forecasting, uh, you should estimate your accuracy versus horizon. So how does it, how does um, your skill goes down with the, with the horizon? Um, if you are comparing models, if it's appropriate to include statistic significance tests, please do because we'll trust you more. Um, also, um, if you are using forecast for your application, it would be good that you understand how the features of that forecast influence your um, application and maybe think about those features before you are just using forecast as a black box. Um, and finally, um, there is a more and more deep learning models and machine learning models. And it would be nice to sometimes see it compared to stats models too, because why, would, why should we use fancy model if simple model uh, does a job, right? And that's first. And the second is uh, they, they come also with the, you know, like running times with energy consumption and so on. So if you can um, explain why that is needed, great. Um, cross evaluation of, of uh, large enough test sets should be used to compare um, uh, benchmarks and so on. And also because of, uh, as I said, like trust problems and explainability problems, it would be nice also to report about those properties, like what is how, how we interpret these models and how um, we can um, how we can trust them. And uh, when when they don't know things, can they these models can can they tell us that they don't know actually what's going on? This will be more and more important. Okay, and now I'll pass you again to Steve. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to finish off with um, a quick um, bit about what we're maybe trying to do in terms of the, the data <coughs> problem in the UK. Um, so just I'll, I'll very quickly go through these. Um, so we had a, 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 we, we started a data task force in, in October 2018. This was established by the government, the regulator and industry bodies to try and find out uh, about the energy landscape and sort of what sort of were the, the issues and what recommendations we could make to sort of help modernize the digital energy system. Uh, so the report on the right, and if you're, you're interested, you can go to our website and check that out. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so if you just, yeah, go to the next one. So we came up with five recommendations. Um, now, uh, I'll go into only really one of these in detail, but essentially, you know, this was really about sort of providing a landscape, um, you know, just basic foundation to sort of building upon, uh, you know, for the future. The first principle really was about digitalization of the energy system. And what this really, really said is that, you know, each of the DNOs and the network operators should strive towards uh, digitalization, but they should also come up with a digitalization strategy and they have to publish that, um, you know, uh, frequently, I believe maybe every year with Ofgem, the, the uh, energy and gas regulator in the UK. Um, you know, and they had to make provisions for, you know, what new data they needed, which could improve the energy system, and then sort of what continuous improvement they could make. There's also sort of three building blocks, which we thought were very necessary as well to sort of help the innovation community and also the, the network operators. And part of that was coming with a data catalog with a very common, um, you know, metadata standards and, and so that everyone could speak the same language. 
and that we also understood what data sets people had and therefore people could request them if there were a big problem was that we didn't necessarily always understand you know what data was available you know what net you know what was the data a supplier had or a network operator um, and this would help us sort of understand what they could request to their <coughs> um, we also asset register strategy was very important what what assets did you have you know where were the cables where were the substations and we integrated this all we the idea is to integrate this all into a full dis digital system map of the uk um, the only other recommendation I just want to then talk in detail about is the presumed open principle, which really supports the sort of open data thing we've been talking about. So if you could just move to the next slide. Um, so this was really about trying to say, let's start from a place of saying, let's open, let's assume that the data is open. So a network operator should say, right, you know, all my data is open. And if you can't make it open, you have to have a good reason for doing it. So it's sort of like, if you make something presumed open, we're more likely to make all the data sets open um, and there'll be less uh, sort of keeping data sort of within silos and, and un, un inaccessible to the public. But there's obviously a lot of good reasons why data can't be made available. There's commercial issues. You know, it might be something very important to your business model or it have maybe have some IP involved with it. There might be security issues and there's certainly that within some of the networks. Or there might be other things which might impact consumers or, or for other reasons. So you could go through this triage process, which, which came with the presumed open principle. Uh, and therefore you could sort of find out, you know, to what level you could make your data open, or perhaps you could um, make it open, but make sure there's certain licenses or terms and conditions attached to it. Um, and finally, you could also try and apply some data modification techniques, some anonymization maybe, or uh, differential privacy, which would reduce the risk that was involved with it, and that could still be released. Um, so yeah, next slide, please. I think I, I, I don't want to go into this, but we sort of had a follow up to the data task force, which kind of looks more broadly at digitalization. Um, so if you're interested in that, the link's uh, written on the screen there below, you can go to our website. And this has also come up with a number of rec uh, recommendations. Um, I realize we're a bit short on time, so I won't go into too much detail. Um, but you, they're all sort of contained there on the, the right hand side. So, yeah, um, I think that's really everything from me then. Um, I guess the final slide is just thank you. Um, and I guess we're both happy to answer some questions. Great. Thank you very much, Danitz and Stephen. This has been really nice. So uh, I think we have some questions in the chat and then we'll follow up, you know, the we sort of have seven minutes till top of the hour, but if needed, we'll continue. So people who need to drop, they can drop, but if there is a discussion, we can still go on. So um, maybe Professor Ning Lu, Ning, you want to ask your question yourself? Yeah, my question is mainly about the debt uh, feeder level uh, forecast because we're uh, doing some similar work. And then I wonder your MAPE calculation um, how did you calculate that? Is it a 15 minutes um, forecast or uh, what, what's the resolution? And then also when you do this forecast, are you aggregating the smart meter level forecast to the feeder level and then compare that with the feeder level data? Like you have data data, but directly do the feeder level forecast. What's, what's the, the context when you calculate that MAPE? Yeah, so uh, I believe you're talking about the scaling law picture I showed earlier. Uh, yeah. So that was real LV feeders. So uh, it was measured at the at the LV level. So it was yeah on the feeders using from SCADA basically uh, system. The um, we 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 have looked at some aggregation stuff in other areas, but as I say, there's a mismatch between a real LV feeder and yeah. uh, and sort of these aggregations. Um, and you know, it's 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 sometimes it's like the profiles are, are very different. You have, for instance, overnight storage heaters, which I'm not sure if you have in 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 America, but often it's other things like street furniture, your street lighting, you know, your cameras um, that are all connected up on that. So so the features are a little bit different sometimes from uh, you know the the aggregated level to you know aggregating versus measuring at the aggregated level. Um, but I think there's a deeper question there as well as whether or not if you could aggregate, would it be more accurate to, you know, forecast the individual time series and then aggregate, or would it be yet better to aggregate and and um, and then forecast? I don't. I'm not sure. I don't really have the answer. I think there's an interesting problem there. 
um, and each of them has advantages and disadvantages, both in an academic and sort of industrial circle. So um, it's an interesting problem. I, I don't have the answer. I, my, I suspect aggregated is, is easier. Um, but, you know, the errors may also cancel out if you aggregate on the after forecasting. Um, so I don't know. Um, just to then answer about the MAPE, we did do MAPE for that. I kind of, I, I'm cautious about using MAPE and I, I often don't tell people to use MAPE. Um, the reason we use MAPE in this, uh, you know, in this example was because it's a very common one. So we, we wanted to sort of allow comparisons of, amongst other papers, but because it has this division by zero, I would advise anyone who's doing low voltage forecasting to avoid it. Um, so I don't want anyone to be thinking I'm condoning maybe MAPE, but it is a point-wise error measure. And if you read the paper, we also did two other error measures, including probabilistic error measures. So we did some uh, continuous ranked probability scores as well. Um, and we, we made them relative scores in different ways. So, yeah. Thank you very much, Stephen. I maybe Rabab Haider. Rabab, you want to ask your question? Sure. Hi. Thank you so much for the um, the great presentation. It was really interesting. Um, I towards the end, you kind of mentioned the use of ML um, and in different parts of applications, including in this case, load forecasting. Um, I, and from a power systems perspective, there's kind of these obvious disadvantages of ML: the complexity, the high energy usage. Um, but also kind of the security constraints and um, in terms of being able to meet a reliable power system. So in your experience, what is the, the, the gap between ML and power systems? Um, and how do we kind of move forward in closing that gap and trying to see if ML is the right tool for certain power systems applications? Um, I think it, um, uh, I, I can just talk from from UK perspective mostly, uh, but I found here uh, because power engineers don't do much computing, like uh, maybe in Serbia, as Maria knows, and so on. So there is a big mistrust, you know, like uh, kind of we are engineers and these people are kind of messing with computers. So I think there is a there is a big cultural step to 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 go over to, to <coughs> convince basically engineers that uh, you know like this can be vetted and and used, and it's used in other uh, safety critical systems, and you know like. So, so, so I think there is a big just cultural kind of uh, chasm that that needs to be uh, uh, taken over before before we can we can apply these things. But I think yeah, things things, things are getting a bit better because younger generations are basically um, um, kind of more used to 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 ML. Danix, I if I may, uh, Danix, if I may just add one comment to this mm -hmm. or sort of thought or mm -hmm. question. Uh, if I, I missed a little bit the beginning of what Stephen said, but if um, there was some interruption on my side. So uh, probably people would, this gap would be bridged easier if we managed as a research community to make the case about functionalities that cannot be done without. Without, yeah, yeah, yes. absolutely. And I think that here at MIT, Rabab knows even from the course, you know, it's just what is, what is all this digitalization for? What is that you cannot do uh, in terms of your electricity bill, in terms of neighborhood, in terms of decarbonization, all sorts of things. I think I honestly think that there is uh, that gap. That how do we map the best machine learning tool to what is it good for me as a customer and so mm -hmm. forth? Maybe Stephen, you talked about that, but I might have missed. What is the basic motivation for doing this? Can you comment a little more? Well, yeah. Um, okay, so. There's a lot of points in there as well. Um, I guess there's an interesting, so we've looked at skills as well. So the Catapult, because we sort of sit in the middle as well, we're really interested in the skills gap here. So it's not that the prob there isn't problems out there, but I think without the data being there, that's a big problem. Because how do you, you know, how do you sort of tackle that issue if you don't have the, the data in the first place? And I think that overlaps with another point though, which is, um, Data science in general is the data skills gap is still there across the board. And the problem there is, and I think you hit a good point there uh, in terms of saying the, you know, how do you make a really interesting problem 
Well, because at the you, moment, and all the graduates today. running off to finance, you know, they're running off to finance and very exciting areas which pay very well relative to energy sector, I'd say. But use of data, I think, um, I see Rupamati Jadivada is here, with, you mentioned Pecan Street data, Danice. Uh, we actually had access to an RPAE project and actually Rupamati got her PhD. She was funded on basically demonstrating some automation value, intelligence right? that you, you embed into households in Pecan Street so that um, you, know, you can participate. The basic idea was you can participate even in ancillary services, you know, reserves, mm -hmm. synthetic reserves, even at that time scale. I, um, there is a report on that that we can share with you, but uh, where do you go from there? Who is going to, is that the household needs to embed this automation and uh, monitoring and information exchange? Yeah, I, I don't think so, yeah. Because yeah, I think so I it, will, it will go. Going to, who is going to benefit from all of this? I, um, it, it's a I'd huge like, opportunity, like to, uh, but we need to still make the case, I think. Yeah. Yeah, Brian, absolutely. I think Brian wanted to say something. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to make a comment about you know where data can be used. Uh, I do believe it goes down to the household, uh, but that's not a primary. So you know, if you if you start to use some data that's available at the local level and then um, continue to aggregate uh, both the information as well as the electrical use, um, up in, in tiers, then you just use the data differently. So the whole notion of having open source collection of data is, is really good. Now, the reason that a lot of engineers, uh, electrical engineers, you know, system electricity system engineers are hesitant to be dependent upon data is for most of their careers, they've been indoctrinated to believe that safety is the number one thing uh, yeah. with electricity because it's uh, so uh, widespread and, and can cause <clears throat> Uh, death easily so um just like a critical weapon system or any or a, mm -hmm. uh, autopilot in a jet plane or whatever with passengers uh you need to have systems that that data is being used to to help guide let's say um that also have some native capability that uh is more i'll call it almost hardwired or native to the system and one of the interesting things about the transformation that we're going through, or I think we're going through in electricity, is that the level at which uh, native control can be applied is getting more and more uh, disaggregated, meaning, you know, that finer and finer. So yeah. while we can be more, while data is more useful, it doesn't have to be any more dependable <laughs> than it can be. Um, we need systems that are adaptive and that are natively safe, uh, but can be optimized with the data uh, the majority of time. So I'm not, I'm not as concerned about, you know, making data absolutely valid all the time. As you said, need to, you, know, you need to know what the probability of it being accurate is, and then have a system that can be adaptive. Um, it's sort of like, you know, an electrical system to cause a circuit breaker from tripping when you turn on a, a huge load, a, a huge motor, is we, we have so, soft start uh, on motors so that we don't put those instantaneous loads on the circuit. And that's kind of a native protection to, let's say you had a digital circuit breaker, which can react so quick that, it, that if you grab the high voltage line, you wouldn't get shocked. But that circuit breaker would trip very quickly if you turned on a big motor and it didn't have uh, a soft start capability. So I think I think the, the whole idea of data collection and especially open source allows the various levels of its use to be applied very specifically to what level of capability that level of system has. <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Of the, yeah. yeah. Uh, and to mention, by the way, in the U.S. Uh, about uh, energy, uh, um, what would you call them, energy buffers, uh, like you mentioned, that the heat, overnight heat. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, we do have those. A lot of those were put in uh, when nuclear plants first came online, because as, as we know, the nuclear plant likes a nice level load, right? So one of the ways to do it is the utilities incentivize people to put those systems in so they could uh, pre-charge them at night. Right, just like batteries, and and um, and so that did help the nuclear plants level out their their loads. 
not 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 good enough for an emergency situation in a nuclear plant, but certainly for regular operations, it levels out load. So, so yes, we do. But and you're right that that's a very different profile. What you'll see out of that home or that neighborhood uh, or that community. Sometimes I was near Three Mile Island. It's probably a lot of people know that where that is in Pennsylvania. And and we the whole neighborhoods and whole developments had those uh, systems installed, and their profiles are very different than you would get in the older neighborhoods or even ones that are built today since the nuclear plants are no longer uh, being being built. So uh, at least for a time. So that so yeah, uh, I guess that's all I had to say. I'm sorry, uh, Dana, you had some more to say also. No, no, thanks. That, that, that was a very good comment and I completely agree with you. Um, yeah, it just... Uh... Okay, so I, there is one question here. I think it was from me during the during the the presentation but i'm not quite sure by listening to brian and to danix and steven does this whole situation point into the direction of just little guys self-managing self-monitoring and distributed minimally coordinated interactions with utility um i i don't know because if you think about internet you know like <laughs> it, it might be kind of similar right very similar. Uh, That's exactly what we are saying. Yeah. Yeah. But you yeah, adapt yeah. yourself to some little signal from the outside, but you don't have to tell utility everything about. Oh, no, know, absolutely. When yeah. you wash laundry, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, there is a, and I know that Rabab is doing a mechanical engineering her PhD thesis uh, with Professor Naswami there on, yeah, how far can you down to at least at the distribution level, how far you can push all distributed decisions and little interactions between neighbors. If you have a little more solar and I have less, I need more load. Um, that information exchange requirement and data is completely different than what's needed for telling utility that, uh, you know, during emergency, you do this. So um, again, I think it's extremely important to put machine learning and the, uh, and the data requirements to functionalities at different time scales, and it's, as you said, at a different mm. modes, right? And um, it looks to me, and we, we talk with Brian often, by the way, Brian is going to give a talk shortly, you know, in the same, in this lead series. Mm -hmm. So I really look forward to it because Brian works a lot with microgrids and small customers. So Stephen and Danica make sure that you know you just mm -hmm. also, so that we interconnect. But but it looks to me that uh, we are there are no no enough incentives, not enough educational knowledge to actually do use this data for digitalization and. Uh, so, you know, Danica, you have all these impressive machine learning things, right? Okay, how do I tell my neighborhood why they should put this, this algorithm in their neighborhood or in the household and how to use it? I, I, I think that is a very, very interesting, challenging thing. Otherwise, you know, we're just going our parallel paths, I think. Well, well you know, as I, I, Einstein said, uh, information is uh, used to uh, guide the energy that reorganizes matter. Um, and that's a very profound statement because the opposite is also true, right? That if you have information without the ability to uh, manipulate something, uh, the information is worthless. So the, I think the, the challenge that we should, from a data side that we should put forth is that on the engineering system side, which is the matter that we want to so <laughs> reorganize, control is, right? yeah. we want to control. We have yeah, to have yeah. we have to de devise systems that can be articulated to the maximum uh, uh, use of the information that's available uh, to optimization of that uh, use based on that information. And so I don't think we're there. You know, when you look at our electrical system, it's very very archaic from a phys physics standpoint, mm -hmm. from a physical standpoint. Um, so we have all this wonderful data opportunity uh, to, to attempt to articulate uh, it, those systems, but the systems aren't easily articulated. So one of the things that, uh, that I'll talk about next week here is, is how do we get from, from these basic analog kind of uh, clumsy systems and dumb systems 
uh, to truly artic highly articulatable systems all the way down to the each end application, each load. And, um, and a lot of that has to do with microgrids because that's a microgrid in my, in my world is equivalent to a personal computer or a personal information device. Um, you know, it, if you don't put it in a network, it, it's not a, it's not a, a, a tremendous value. It's it's like good use, yeah. Yeah, it's like an electric typewriter versus a personal. I think, I think this is an excellent point to end our seminar at. And, so, sorry, uh, Maria, there was just one question and oh, uh, Ali, question. Ali H. Okay, sorry, put, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say that uh, for Ali H, uh, yeah, I think Brian. No rush, was, please, no rush, please. Just Brian please. answered with the uh, control. With, you can definitely help with control with ML and also with optimization, because I think, for example, if you look at the local dispatch, this would be a thing that uh, ML can solve, hopefully. Because it's just Rabab because. PhD thesis is about, so you should talk to her. Rabab is doing PhD thesis on that, on distributed op optimization. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is a lot of work hidden in academia that has not connected, as you know well. And uh, so, part of the reason that we are holding these seminars is just to connect the dots, basically. And so, I very much appreciate your time and everybody's time i know everybody is maria one last comment because yes. because i know you you're you're at mit or um is that i've always looked at mit's uh uh work in systemic thinking because one element that very often uh is left out of the data and and left out of the um, uh, systems uh, is the systems thinking which includes human behavior and human behavior is not as, as we've just witnessed through the COVID situation, human behavior is not directly connected to the hard data or the, or, or the, uh, the physics of things. Uh, it has, a, in a sense, a mind of its own because it's based on, on uh, a, a, psych, a psychoanalytic, of, of, if you will, of the world and the data that's available. So it it's often has a, a different behavior than we would expect if we looked at pure physics or pure science. So we, we need to also incorporate that thinking, that human behavioral thinking into uh, the forecasting of, you know, any forecasting of data and, and, and use of data as well. So just a thought. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, everybody. I, we lost Pedro Carvalho. He was an important listener also from uh, Portugal. You may want to connect with him later. He's doing a lot of work. I'll connect you. He's doing there was no opportunity i guess he didn't ask and you know maybe he went to do something else after the hour but uh, he is doing a lot of work even in uk and the low voltage distribution grids and uh, it's sort of coming at it from nitty-gritty things if you have unbalanced faults what happens who takes care of it and it, you need that level of detail you know even in this changing industry and he is a great resource for that so i will try to connect you yeah. thank you guys Brilliant. thank you very much yeah yeah many thanks for the opportunity maria and then sure, yeah i really enjoyed and i apologize about dan Bull's pronunciation of danica vukadinovic grita <laughs> <laughs> and stephen haven so you know the reason i ask him to introduce is because of that i want people to practice people's names <laughs> So, but uh, it's really a pleasure to meet you in person or not in 3D, in 2D. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yourself. Kudos, thank you. Kudos, to, kudos to the presenters. Thank you so much. It's very thank you, enlightening. Yes. Thank you. Thanks thank for you, your uh, yeah, really conversation. Uh, keep in contact. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.